Amen. So <clears throat> we're continuing on in our series on Sunday mornings, going through the distinctive doctrines or definitive doctrines. And of course, we've been looking at each one of those letters and the acronym of Baptist. And we went through, of course, first of all, biblical authority, the inerrancy and preservation of scripture, the autonomy of the local church, the independence of the local body, and the priesthood of the believers, what we talked about last week, which was where we discussed the fact that we as believers has access, have the access of prayer through Christ, that we can come to the very throne of God. And today we're going to be on that, uh, the T of that, the, ba uh, the Baptist part of that is going to be on the T. And what we're going to talk about is the two ordinances of the local church. So there's two ordinances that uh, we believe here, that we practice as a church, and that is, of course, believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, baptism is a subject I think I've preached on a few times this year already, uh, even recently. I think most, most of us in here have heard some uh, preaching on baptism. So I will touch on that this morning, but I want to focus mainly on that second ordinance of the Lord's Supper. That's not something uh, we've preached a lot about here uh, in, in Tucson. But uh, what is an ordinance, uh, first of all? What is it to, 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 to say that we believe in two ordinances? And that word is ordinance is not something that we use a lot. But really what an ordinance is, is just a remembrance. It is just a memorial. Uh, it can mean some other things as well that we'll see. But if you look here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, it says... And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance. So what was the ordinance? It was the memorial of the feast, right? Go ahead and jump down there to verse 17. It says, And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought, the, uh, brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day. What is they saying? You're going you're to uh, point out this particular day. This is going to be a special day. It's going to be a memorial to you. You shall observe this day in your generations by what? By an ordinance. Okay, so we see again that an ordinance is just a memorial. It's an observance, at least as we see it here used in this context of Scripture. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you know, it served as an ordinance. It served uh, as a time for them to observe their deliverance from Egypt. And it was a memorial to them. You know, we, we have something similar here to, today in the United States. We call it Memorial Day. You know, that we, we sto everything stops and people think about uh, the veterans that have served and things of that. And, and, and that's a day where everyone stops to, to do what? To remember them. We call it Memorial Day. So this is similar in that sense. It's a day where they were to stop and they were to remember things that have taken place in the past. It was an ordinance to them. And we, so we observe things, uh, when we say we observe the ordinances in the church, we observe the ordinance of baptism and communion. Why? Why do we observe those as an ordinance? Because we observe them as a memorial for our own deliverance, right? They were observing this, of course, the ordinance of uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover because of the fact that God had brought them out, right? He delivered their armies out of Egypt. And we do the same thing today as a, lo a local New Testament church, except we're simply observing something different. We're observing what Christ has done for us, you know, our own personal de deliverance through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So we see, first of all, that an ordinance is a remembrance. It's a memorial. It's a recalling of something that is, uh, it should have meaning to us personally. And then also an ordinance is something to be obeyed, right? If we were to uh, say we're going to give somebody an ordinance, it's something that has to be obeyed. It's a command, if you would. So an ordinance is given by, uh, sometimes, often, uh, an authority. I mean, is this not God giving the ordinance? And he, of course, is an authority unto them. He's giving them this authority uh, or giving this ordinance by authority. So an ordinance can be a memorial. It can also be something that is to be obeyed. It can be either civil or religious in nature, too. Of course, we're here where we're talking about observing these things, these two ordinances. They're religious in nature. But there's also what we would call civil ordinances. And what are they? They are decrees. They are things that are just given uh, through authority that are to be obeyed. <coughs> so uh, if we were to actually go to the dictionary and look up the word ordinance, you know, it, it is an authoritative order or it is a religious right. That's what the Bible or the uh, or dictionary would define it as. So an ordinance is something that is ordained. I mean, think about the word itself, ordinance, right? Ordain. It's, the pretty much, it's the same word practically. So an ordinance is something that somebody else ordains. They say, you know, you're going to do this. The speed limit is going to be such and such miles per hour. It has been ordained by civil authorities. That's the speed limit. God is saying, you shall observe this day. It shall be an ordinance unto you. It's something that he has ordained. It's something that has been decreed officially, right? Somebody in, in, a, in a position of authority has decreed something officially and said, this is a, uh, an, ord an ordination. It is an ordinance. <coughs> 
And we can think, of course, go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 13, and we'll get a better sense of the word, what, how, of how it's used, the word ordinance in the Bible. You're going to Romans 13, but it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. What's he talking about? He's saying obey the laws of the land. You know, as long as they're not uh, you know, in direct conflict with Scripture, or if obeying them would put you, uh, would cause you to disobey God. Of course, Romans 13 teaches us that we have to obey the higher powers. God is that ultimate power. But we are to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man. And what is that? Again, the laws. Look there in Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are be, uh, be are ordained of God. So God has ordained these powers, these civil authorities. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. They have resisted what God has ordained. So again, an ordinance is something that is ordained. It's something that is decreed officially, whether it be in a religious context or in a civil context. So we're going to discuss this morning the ordinances or the things that have been decreed to us as a, new, a local New Testament church. Uh, and those things are, of course, the believer's baptism as well as the Lord's Supper. So what is baptism? Of course, we've talked about this at length in other sermons, but just to go over it very quickly, baptism is merely a memorial of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what it is. It's a picture of his death. If you're there in Romans, look over to uh, chapter 6, Romans chapter 6. And it's always important to kind of talk about baptism whenever it comes up because there's a lot of false doctrine concerning baptism. It's always good to go back over these things and be reminded of these things and to remember these things. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Knowing not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, does it, did we literally die when we were baptized? I'm, you know, probably not. If you're here this morning, you probably survived your baptism, right? Didn't hold you down too long. What he's saying, when you were baptized into Jesus Christ, you were baptized into his death. You were relating to that, right? Spiritually speaking, it is a picture of his death. It is also a picture of his burial. Look there in verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. Again, it's, we're picturing the going down under the water, being buried with Christ. It is also a picture of his resurrection. It continues on there in verse 4. That like as Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father, even, also, uh, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, those are literally the words that many of us recite when we baptize somebody to buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. And what are we talking about? We're, 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 what is baptism? It is simply a picture of what Christ has done for us. It is, a, it is a, an observance. It is a memorial of the things that have got, uh, Christ has done for us. So really, the ordinance of baptism is simply a physical picture of a spiritual reality. That's all it is. You know, and people want to get real confused about what it, uh, it is. They'll teach you that you have to be baptized to be saved. They'll call it a sacrament. You know, all these different uh, religions and denominations that want to use baptism incorrectly. But really, when we look at Scripture, all it is is simply a picture of a spiritual reality. That we have been buried with Christ in ba into baptism, uh, into his death by baptism, through salvation, and that we've been raised again to walk in newness of life. We're just picturing what Christ has done for us. <clears throat> the Bible says, go ahead and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll read you from Colossians 12. It says, we are buried with him in baptism. We are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, and that he hath quickened us together with him. So baptism is a picture of salvation. It is not salvation itself. Amen. It says there in Colossians 2 that we are risen with him through faith in the operation of God. How is it that we're risen spiritually? Through faith, not through our baptism. Right. And that he says that he has forgiven us. That's how we're saved, we're born again, is through his, uh, the operation of God, the fact that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 21, the like figure, like figure whereunto... Even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting the way of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, look, uh, baptism saves us in the sense that it's not putting away the filth of the flesh. And that's exactly what you have to do if you want to be saved. You have to get your sins taken care of. You can't, right. have any, uh, you can't go to heaven in your flesh. You know, no flesh should glory in his presence. Right. So he's saying it's not, you know, it saves us not in the sense that we're putting away its sinful flesh, but that be, it is the answer of a good conscience towards God, that we have, uh, have a good conscience, that we've come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That, and we're just picturing that in baptism. See, a person can get saved, they can receive Christ as Savior and never get baptized and go to heaven. Right. Because baptism is not something that is necessary for salvation. 
It is not the putting away of the sinful flesh. It is the answer of a good conscience, something that has taken place within that believer, answering back to God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, I'll read to you, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot, purge your conscience? So how do you get that purged conscience? How do you get a good conscience? How do you answer back? In a, a, how, do you, how do you have a good conscience to answer toward God? It's through the blood of Christ, right? It is the blood of Christ that purges our conscience, not our baptism, not our good works. It's His blood. And it says from dead works to serve the living God. You see, the ordinance of baptism, it simply shows the work of faith in the believer. It's saying, look, I've, I've got a good conscience towards God. My, my, my conscience has been purged through the blood of Christ. I can, I can stand before God in, in good standing with a good conscience because I've been saved through the blood of Christ. And it just that's all baptism is showing, that that has taken place. And it is a, it is the work, uh, it's the work of faith in the believer. right? And what does the believer do? They, they are to serve the living God, right? Now, they don't need to do that in order to go to heaven. But if you're going to serve the living God, one of the first things you're going to do is to get baptized. And, and that's all baptism is. It's just showing people, I am a believer. I have put my faith in Christ. It is a public declaration of their faith. And it is them, uh, the believer responds to God in obedience to his word, and they are baptized. Not be, to be saved, but because they are saved. So people who are serious about serving God, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to get in church, and they're going to get baptized. And that's really how you know if somebody's you know, taking the Christian life seriously, if they start to obey the commands. And say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, for a lot of people, you know, coming to church is a big deal. You know, especially if, if we're more on the shy side, if we're more introverted, you know, walking into a building full of strangers, you know, it can, for some people, take, a, that's a big step of faith. You know, and that's why it is an act of obedience. Or to say, hey, I'm going to be faithful to the services. You know, that's, that could take a real discipline. That could take, you know, some real... Uh, you know, uh, making that a priority in your life. That, that is something that you have to work into. That is serving God. You say, well, being baptized, how hard is that? Well, again, you know, everyone's watching you get dunked underwater. You know, you, some, some guy you hardly know is going to grab your face and hold you underwater for a second. <laughs> you know, for kids, it's a big deal. You know, the, there's the fear of water and things like that. They have to get over all this and, and everyone's looking at you and that kind of a thing. So we can see how going to church and being baptized these are things that we obey. These are things that we do if we're serious about serving God. We don't do these things in order to go to heaven. We do these things because we are on our way to heaven and we want to serve God on the way there. <laughs> we can choose not to do those things, but you know, we'll get to heaven and we won't have the rewards. And we'll be, you know, God probably won't bless us in this life either. So, <clears throat> so we see for, that's basically you know, all I really want to talk about as far as the baptism this morning. And, if you have more questions about baptism, I don't think anyone in this room does. Like I said, I've preached twice on it already this year. There's other sermons that I've preached you can go back and listen to. Uh, you know, Pastor Anderson's preached on it. So, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. But I do want to move on to the second ordinance, which is the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And that's something that I'd like to spend a little bit more time on. And really, what is the ordinance of the Lord's Supper? Again, it's just a remembering. It's a memorial. Remember our definition. So if you would, turn over to Luke chapter 22, and we'll start to get into that there. Luke chapter 22. And it's important to understand this too. It seems like a simple doctrine, and it is. But again, these are two doctrines that are twisted by uh, a lot of different churches and denominations into saying you have to keep these things in order to be saved. Right? That they'll say, well, you have to be baptized. And the Catholic Church, will, for one, will teach you that you have to receive communion. You have to receive the Eucharist. Right. And you have, that's how that's you're working your way into heaven. There's one of the, I believe there's, more there's at least seven i believe there's more than that as far as the sacraments and the things that you have to do along the way in order to earn your way to heaven and receiving the lord's supper is one of them but what is what is it scripturally again we're going to let the bible be our final authority we're going to let you know that's what this whole uh, series is about you know that's that was the the bedrock in which the series was laid that was the first b right the bapt in baptist that was the first letter we went over biblical authority letting the bible define for us what we ought to believe so what does the Bible say about the ordinance of the Lord's Supper? We'll look over here at Luke chapter 22, verse 19. It says, of course, this is Christ observing the Passover with his 12 disciples right before he is arrested and crucified. And it says in verse, uh, Luke 22, verse 19, And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in order to go to heaven. Right? No, that's not what it says. He says, This do in remembrance of me. So again, 
we see that the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is simply a memorial. It's a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. Likewise, also after the, uh, also the cup after supper, saying, this, is the cup, uh, in the new, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So he did these things as an ordinance because he wanted them to remember the things that he was about to do for them, that his body would be broken, that his blood would be shed. So the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is simply a remembering, it's a memorial of what Christ has done for us, just as much as baptism is. It's just another way of remembering it. And you can see already there's two different ways God wants us to keep, constantly keep that in mind, that Christ has died, buried, and rose again. It seems like a pretty important, uh, uh, something that we should keep in front of our minds, right? Every time we see a baptism, it should remind us of that. Every time we receive the Lord's Supper, observe the Lord's Supper, it should be reminding us of the same thing, that Christ's body was broken, that his blood was shed for us to go to heaven. Not, that our, not of our own works of righteousness, uh, but by his grace he saved us. You know, that our, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's what it should be reminding us, is that we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. That's what these things should be reminding us of because it will remind us again of the sacrifice that Christ made. So <laughs> the ordinances are remembering. It's a memorial of what Christ has done for us. And it is not a means of salvation. Again, a lot of false doctrine teaches that you have to do this in order to go to heaven. And one such church that would teach that is the Catholic Church. They will teach you that this is a means of salvation. Now keep something there in Luke and turn over to John chapter 6. Now I'm gonna, you're going to have to get a little ambidextrous this morning. When you keep something in Luke 22... Get to John chapter 6, and I want you to keep a finger in both places because we're going to come back to John 6 uh, just a little bit later. So <laughs> you're there in John 6. Why does the Catholic Church teach that? I mean, how can one trillion people, you know, a seventh of the earth's population that they claim to be their members, or one, did I say trillion? <laughs> I meant billion, right? There's that many people. Boy, maybe we are running out of room, right? <laughs> so, but uh, how could so many people have it wrong? Well, they, they have scripture they turn to. Every false doctrine has some scripture that they're going to turn to, and they're going to twist it or misunderstand it or misrepresent it. And they go to John chapter 6. This is one of their primary verses. It says in John 6, verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. I mean, that sounds pretty literal. He's talking pretty bluntly. He's saying, look, you have to eat my flesh. You have to drink my blood. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As, a living, uh, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, uh, even he shall live by me. So if you were to just take that passage and say, well, there you go, there's your doctrine. You know, now we've got to figure out how we're going to go and eat. I mean, Jesus isn't here anymore for us to, to, to eat and to drink, right? So then they have this whole doctrine of transubstantiation. You know, I, I'm glad I said it. I don't know how I could spell it. But where they actually believe that when they receive the Eucharist, when they receive the, the wine, that it literally turns into the flesh and blood of Christ. Literally. That after it's consumed in their body, in their stomach, it literally becomes the flesh and blood of Christ. That's what they believe. Now, that's a very strange doctrine. That's a very odd doctrine. Uh, but they have to do that. They have to have a company. They, obviously, they can't go find. They, they can't go down to the grocery store and buy a pack of. You know, I don't want to sound sacrilegious here or, or blasphemous, but they can't go buy a pound of Jesus' flesh. Right. They can't go to the cooler and get some blood. Right. You know, so they have to come up with this strange doctrine to say, well, this is how you receive it. And now they've kind of got. If that's the truth, now they kind of got, they've kind of got us because they're the only ones. Their priesthood is the only one that can that can make that that magical uh, miracle happen. And now we have to go to that man. Now we have to have a mediator between us and God. Remember we talked about last week, the fact that we don't have a mediator between us and God, that Christ is our only mediator. Right. <laughs> but now we have to go to a man who's going to say some hocus pocus and put a cracker in our mouth, and now we can go to heaven. So you can see why, um, why man would want to come up with such a doctrine, because it puts you, gives you a lot of control over people. And that's why they would ban the reading of the Bible. You know? That's what I find, and I'm kind of go off on a rant here, but that's why I find so funny when people call uh, uh, people like us you know, that we're in a cult. You're in a cult. No cult says, read the Bible for yourself and right. judge what I say. They say, oh, let me have that. I'll tell you what it says. Right. You know, they, don't, they don't tell you to think for yourself by reading the Bible and you decide whether or not I'm wrong. They say, no, I'll tell you whether I'm right or wrong and you, you let me read the Bible to you. you know, the Mennonite, I don't know if the Mennonites do that, but definitely the, uh, the Amish. Yeah. You know, that's a big one. 
They say it's a scary thing to read the, read the Word of God, that it's dangerous. Yep. You shouldn't do that. You should just let a few men in their, in, their, in their community teach you what it says. And it's the same thing, you know, for the Catholic Church for a long time. They have it in a language, they would give services in a language that people didn't even understand. So they could keep them. They would speak Latin and nobody was speaking Latin. So that they could keep them in the dark and keep the power, uh, keep them under control. But you could see here in John 6 why if we were to just turn to that passage and just say, you could just walk away, that's all you're ready to say, wow, I've got to literally eat Jesus and literally drink his blood. But we have to remember the context, right? Who is he speaking to in this passage? He's speaking to unsaved, Christ-rejecting Jews. He's speaking to his enemies. Those that, want, that were rejecting him as Messiah. That's who he's speaking to. And he did this so that they could not understand the truth. He deliberately spoke this way so that they could not understand the truth. You say, why would he really do that? Keep something in John 6, turn over to Matthew chapter 13. Yes, he would do that. He would, say, he would open his mouth in dark sayings. Yep. He would speak in parables to confuse them so that they could not understand. Look there in Mark, uh, Matthew, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 10. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in a, thou unto them in a parable? You say, why are you speaking these guys in a parable all the time? You're speaking the same group, the same Jews. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. He said, the reason I'm speaking these parables is because it's not given them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. <coughs> They're shut out from it. He doesn't want them to understand it. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. And what advantage hath the Jew? Much every way. Chiefly because unto them belong the oracles of God. Right? They had the scriptures. They had the fathers. They were in uh, the priesthood. They, were they should have been reading. They should have known and understood that this is the Christ. But they had not, so it was taken away from them. And, 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 and he's saying, look, whomsoever much is given, shall also much be required. When he shows up and does the miracles and teaches and say, I am he, and except you believe I am he, you shall die in your sins, and they reject him, right. then he says that it's not given unto you to know the kingdom of heaven. Right. See, there is, a, and then we're kind of getting off to another doctrine, but there is such a thing as being given over, being a reprobate, being rejected of God. Right. It comes to a point in people's lives where they reject God, reject God, reject God, where God finally rejects them. Right. And they can no longer come to the knowledge of the truth. He says there, Therefore speak I unto them in parables. Why? Because to them it is not given. And in them is filled the pro prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. He's saying, look, these people are not going to see, they are not going to hear, and they are not going to be converted. And that's why I'm going to speak to them in parables so that they cannot know. That's why he's telling them, hey, you want to go to heaven, you've got to eat my flesh. You've got to drink my blood. And go ahead and turn back over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. That's when he got done saying. So that's, that's the context of, this, of the scripture there in, in John 6. That's who he's speaking to. Those that have been given over, those that are not, is not given unto them to know and understand and to believe and to be healed. It says there in John chapter 6, verse 60, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? I mean, that is a hard saying. It's kind of hard. Well, what did you mean by that? How do we, they're saying, we don't understand this. You know, uh, tell us what this means. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, Doth this offend you? What, if it, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. Here's the key. The flesh profiteth nothing. So he's explaining what he said to them. He's saying, look, my, it's not the flesh. It's the Spirit. Right. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, Jesus said to believe his words. You know, to believe what he said and believe that he is who he said he is and that he did what he said he did. The flesh profiteth nothing. They're all confused about, what do you mean eat the flesh? What do you mean drink the blood? He's saying, look, the flesh profiteth nothing. Because he's speaking to them in parables. Right. He's saying, it's my words that matter. They are spirit. They are life. So we see, first of all, that the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is something that we are to remember. It's a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. And that it is not a means of salvation. Okay? It is simply a remembrance of the salvation that we have in Christ through his words, through his uh, through the death burial, his death, burial, and resurrection. 
And really, when we get into the Lord's Supper, we're kind of just getting the practical part of it now. We'll talk about, there are basically two elements to the Lord's Supper. There's two things that, that go into it, right? We saw that there in Luke chapter 22, where he gave them the bread and he gave them the, the cup, right? And he said the two elements of the Lord's Supper are one, breaking bread. Are you still there in Luke? Luke chapter 22, or, or had you keep one of those fingers, right? Luke chapter 22, we're, we're, we're done with all the, 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 the place keeping now for a minute. Luke chapter 22, look at verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and said unto them, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So that's one element of the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread. And what that represents, of course, is it's very clear that it says the broken body of Christ, right? <clears throat> Just as Christ's body was broken, you know, that he breaks the bread. And, of course, we have the drinking of unfermented grape juice. Okay, now a lot of people say, well, that's alcoholic wine. No, it's not. It can't be. First of all, if he's breaking bread, does bread break? No. Did, go, go buy a, a, a loaf of Wonder Bread and see if you can break it. When you think of break, you think like snap, like a broken bone, like, a, like something that, that crunches, right? Well, there's a type of bread that breaks, and it's called unleavened bread, that's right. right? And that's what he's using here. And it, we, we read that this morning in Exodus 12 about the fact that they were not to have any leaven in their houses. Right. They were not to have any leaven in their food. They were to use unleavened bread. That's what he's using here. And the reason why that is is because leaven in the Bible is a picture of sin. So if he's using this bread to represent his broken body, it would have to be a sinless, it would have to represent a sinless body. Right. Because Christ was without sin. Amen. Therefore, that's why he used unleavened bread to picture his sinless body, right? And that's why it's a bread that breaks. So he's using that, and, and that's why he also used it unfermented grape juice. You know, wine. Now here's the thing, people say, well, it says, you know, the wine. You know, every, and people have this mistaken notion that every time the word wine is used in the Bible, that it's referring to alcoholic beverage. Well, it's not. I mean, think about all the other beverages that the, that the, 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 the Bible refers to. It refers to water multiple times, right, abundantly. It refers to milk, right, but, and it refers to something called wine. But, and now we're going to sit here and say, well, every time it says wine, it's just referring to alcoholic beverage. Okay, it, sometimes it does. That's true. Sometimes it does. But what about grape juice? You know, what about juice? You're going to tell me the Bible that talks about water and talks about milk. Is it going to talk about juice? The fact, I mean, that's something that's consumed, right? It's been consumed throughout all of mankind. Of course, the Bible is going to address that. But it just calls it by the same name, wine. And you have to read the context of where that word is used to get the sense of whether or not it's talking about, you know, a fermented alcoholic beverage or just the, 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 the grape or the, the, uh, the fruit of the vine is what it calls it. So it makes sense here that if he's going to represent his sinless body with unfermented or you know uh, bread without leaven which is what we would call yeast today right it would only make sense that his his blood would be represented in the same manner as sinless unfermented without leaven meaning you know non-alcoholic wine or what we would call today juice okay <coughs> and it says there in verse 17 and he took the cup and gave thanks said and said take this and divide it among yourselves for i say unto you i will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So what was that he was giving? He was giving them the fruit of the vine, a grape. And people say, well, they couldn't make grape juice back then. It's really easy to make grape juice. You just take grapes and you squeeze them, and you have grape juice. Right? It talks about, uh, was it Ezra? Or was it, yeah, I believe it was Ezra who, who would, he was the, uh, the king's cupbearer, and he would squeeze the grapes into the, into the I'm, I think I'm getting it wrong, but it's somewhere in the Old Testament. One of those guys, I'm just flying off the cuff here, he would literally take and he would squeeze the grapes into Pharaoh's cup. It was one of the, I think it was actually the butler that, that did that uh, back in Joseph's story. He would take the cups and he would squeeze them into Pharaoh's cup. And that's how fresh, I mean, you want to talk about getting fresh juice, right? And, you know, and that's, that's a real luxury, right? It makes sense that a king would have that. You know, we, we, we kind of take that for granted today because there's just machines that harvest these fruits and then they go to some factory where just, they're just squeezed in mass and then just poured into some bottle and trucked all over the country and kept refrigerated. You know, we, we take that for granted, but back then it was a, a real luxury. So anyway, I'm kind of going off, but the point is, is that this juice was unfermented. Why? Because it was represented the blood of Christ that was shed for the remission of sins. So it had to be sinless. So, and both are unleavened, right? To represent the sinless perfection of Christ. Right. <coughs> and you know, again, the wine does not always mean an alcoholic beverage. <coughs> 
And just to kind of drive that home, I'll read one verse to you, because this is a whole other topic. Isaiah 65, verse 8. You know, you could, you could look this up if you wanted to on your own time, but I'll read it to you. Thus saith the Lord, as new wine is found in the cluster. Right? Where did he say it was found? In the cluster. Now, what is he referring to? The juice that's in the cluster of a grape. And what does he call it? Wine. The new wine, right? So, we see, first of all, that the, the two elements in the Lord's Supper are the bread and the wine. They're unleavened. Okay? They're without their, their grape juice and unleavened bread. We see also that uh, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is something that is to be observed by believers. It's not something that we just do with anybody. We're not just going to pull some guy out the street and that's unsaved and say, hey, let's go have the Lord's Supper together. It's something that's supposed to be done among God's people with, you know, with believers. The unsaved should not partake in it. They don't even understand what it represents. I mean, if the whole point is that it's a memorial, the whole point is that it's an ordinance, what, what does it profit some unsaved person? They don't, it, to them, it's just a snack. Yeah, right. But when we're, e when we're eating it, when we're partaking of it, you know, it's not some mystical, magical thing that's taking place. It's simply us bringing to remembrance again the things that Christ has done for us, His suffering for us. So it's to be observed by believers. Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Actually, go to Acts chapter 2. We'll take the time and look at these. These are important. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, look at verse 41. Acts 2.41. It is to be observed by believers. Then uh, Acts 2.41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Okay, so there's that first ordinance again, that baptism, right? And who is being baptized? They that gladly received his word, those that had believed on the truth. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, I believe when he's referring to that, in breaking of bread, that's talking about communion or the Lord's Supper. That's them talking about, again, there's that breaking, right? The breaking of an unleavened bread. In breaking of bread and in prayers, jump down to verse 46. And they continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, right? So they're going house to house, breaking this bread. Did, their meat, well, uh, did eat their meat with gladness and with singleness of heart. <coughs> so we see there, that who is it that's breaking bread? It's they that received his word. They that were added unto the church, right? They that were in one accord in the temple. They were breaking bread day, uh, from house to house. And, 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 and so we see, first of all, it's observed by believers. Now turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 6. Acts chapter 20, verse 6. We'll see another place where they break bread. It says in Acts 20, verse 6, And we sailed from, uh, away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto, the, uh, came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Now, who was coming together to break bread? The disciples. So we see, first of all, it's something to be observed by believers. And <coughs> what, the, what the, uh, the, the Lord's Supper is in the New Testament, it is, it is in place of the Old Testament Passover. When did Jesus, re uh, remember, when did Jesus sit down and have this meal? When did he institute the Lord's Supper? It was when they were observing the Passover, right? So go ahead and turn over, uh, I should have had you stay in Luke. Actually, I'll, just, I'll read to you from Luke 22. You don't have to go there. But uh, turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In Luke 22, Jesus said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So what are they sitting down? They're observing the Passover. So we see that in the New Testament, we observe the Lord's Supper in place of the Passover because the Passover was, only, it was just a picture of Christ. And you know that's what the Old Testament uh, pictured, and that's what the New Testament pictures in the Lord's Supper. It pictures Christ. So uh, you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, so who is, who is our Passover today? Do we go out and get a literal lamb? No. Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he is our Passover to us today. He is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So there, is no, there was no lamb at that last supper with the Lord's Supper. There is no lamb and we observe this ordinance today because Christ is that lamb. That's why the meat's missing there. So uh, we see that both the communion and the Passover, they were symbolic of Christ. 
If you would turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, the Bible reads, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? So communion is a proper term to use. You could say the Lord's Supper or you could say communion, right? That's where we get that. It is, it, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, well, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For there, well, we being many are one bread and one body, and we are all partakers of that one bread. So again, the bread and the, uh, and the, and the, 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 the cup that we drink of and, and eat, that is Christ. That's who it represents. But let's go ahead and back up there in 1 Corinthians. Let's get the context here, okay? It says in verse 1, More, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the, under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all eat that same spiritual meat and, we all, and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So we see that even all the way back in the Old Testament that it is a picture of the church, right? That they are fathers, right? And it's great that he's speaking to Gentiles there and calling them our fathers, right? And he says that they, they passed through the sea and were baptized, right? So we have a picture of salvation in the fact, you know, in, in, when Israel was in Egypt and they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, right? That's a picture of salvation. And it was something you had to do personally, you know, each house, to, each house had to do that individually. And then they, so that's a picture of us getting saved and then God leading us out of Egypt, out of the wilderness, or out of, the, out of Egypt, out of bondage, you know, the bondage to sin that, that we experience as, as sinners, you know, under a cruel taskmaster, the devil, Pharaoh, we're brought out of that bondage through the blood, and then, and, and then we go into the, 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 the Red Sea crossing, right? That's a picture of baptism. It says they were baptized in the sea. Well, think about it, you had the water on the sides, and they had the cloud above them, right? So they were surrounded on all sides by the water and they went through that's a picture of baptism then of course going into the wilderness you know, that's a picture of whether or not you're going to obey Christ in your Christian life you know the salvation part's already taken care of you know you've already got the blood taken care of you're already following Christ out and you're being baptized you know as an, an act of obedience but from there when you get into the wilderness that's where Christians kind of make it or break it as far as their Christian life you know are they gonna doubt are they gonna be faithless are they gonna backslide are they gonna murmur and complain and want desire to go back to the world, back to Egypt, back to that taskmaster, and God's going to chasten and punish them in this life? Or are they going to be like that generation that came up after them and went into the promised land? And yes, they had to fight many battles. They had to fight you know, an enemy, but God was with them. So that whole thing, that whole story, the Old Testament Israel is a beautiful picture, is a great picture of the New Testament believer. So <laughs> we see that one of the things that they did back then was that they observed the Passover. And today we do the same thing when we observe the Lord's Supper. So we see, first of all, that it was something that was to be uh, observed by believers, that it is, a, it is in place of the Old Testament Passover, and that it is symbolic of Christ in every instance. But the other thing I want us to, uh, to understand before we go, and this is something where we differ from a lot of Baptist churches, okay? And this is Faithful Word Baptist Church. This is what we practice here is when it comes to the Lord's Supper, is that we believe that, it is, that the Lord's Supper is to be pr observed privately. It is not a public uh, observance. Now, that goes a lot against the grain of a lot of Baptist churches, and that's fine. You know, and we don't have to condemn other churches that observe it differently. We're not doing that. And, and, uh, and, but I believe that this is correct that it is to be observed privately. Because here's the thing, this, this doctrine is not something that's expounded a great deal in Scripture. We have these few examples that we look to to get some sense of how it's to, excuse me, how it's to be done. But we have very few examples of, 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 of it actually being done in a local church. And if you would, look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we're going to look at a church, the one instance where we see it being observed by a church, publicly, and see what... what the scripture has to say. Now it says there, now this, uh, verse 17, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. So he's about to rebuke them. He's saying, look, I'm not about to praise you. And if we recall in the beginning of this chapter, he said he praised them that they kept the ordinances that he, as he delivered unto them, right? And he goes on, he says, I praise you in these ordinances. And he talks about hair length on a man and a woman. That's what he was praising them about. You know, that they kept those ordinances. But when he gets to verse 17, he says, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. So now here's, here's a place where you're in error. And the Corinthian church had a lot of problems. I mean, they are not the model church. They're the model church in the sense of a church at getting it right. And that's a great example if that's something that a church needs to do. Uh, 
you know, how to deal with sin and how to receive an, uh, one again who has been uh, cast out and that type of a thing. But they are not a model church that we should go to trying to, 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 to be like them. Okay, So he says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come not together for the better, but for the worse. For this, for this of all, when you come together in a church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. So these people were not in one accord. right? They had heresies. They had divisions. Verse 20, he says this, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, that can be a confusing verse, and people can trip on that. But let's just take it for what it says. It says, when you come together into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. It's saying, when you come together into one place, when we all come together to church, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And again, this is the only scripture you have in the New Testament of, a, of people coming together as a church to observe the Lord's Supper. And he's saying, it's not to do that. Okay? And what this is, is the example, again, the, the example of the Old Testament Passover. We have to keep that in mind. What's the other examples that we have to look to how we should observe the Lord's uh, Supper? We have the example of the Old Testament. If you're there, should have had you stay there in Exodus chapter 12. If you want to turn there, you can. Exodus chapter 12 and begin reading in verse 1. Let's go back to the very beginning. Because again, what is the Lord's Supper? It is a picture of Christ, just as the Old Testament Passover was. It's something that has taken place the, of the Passover. So let's look at the Passover and get an idea of how it, it was observed then, and let's do it the same today. It says there in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you, speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall bring unto them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So they were all supposed to get their own lamb. Each individual family, each house was supposed to get their own lamb, right? Verse 4, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Because here's the thing, he wanted them to eat the entire lamb. There was, they were not to leave not anything left over until the next day. It was to be consumed completely. So he's saying, look, if you have a big family, just you know, eat that lamb. Now, if your family's small and you're not going to be able to consume that whole thing, get another family with you and you all partake you know, in that house, right? Because he wanted the whole thing to be consumed. And he goes on and says there, according... Uh, and if the household, verse 4, be too little for the lamb, let him take him and his neighbor next unto his house, take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, blemish a male the first year. You shall take it from out of the sheep or of the goats. And he shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now they were to come together and kill it, right? They were to kill it. And then it says this in verse 7, And they shall take the blood and strike on the two side posts on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Yes, they killed it together, right? Showing us that Christ died for all, right? But they, you, just because, you know, he is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. You know, just because, you know, that lamb was killed, that wasn't enough. They then had to go home and put the blood on their house personally, right? And then they had to go inside and eat that lamb themselves, Right? So that was something that was done house to house. That was not something that was done. They didn't get come together as one large body and all eat their lambs. They went into their own homes and ate them privately. <coughs> so, yes, they, 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 they killed it publicly, but they ate it privately. And we could also talk about the example of given by Jesus. Okay, so let's just look at the passages that tell us about the Lord's Supper. And let's, let's base our doctrine on that. When did Jesus, we don't have to turn there again. We were just there this morning, Luke, in all of the passages. Who does Jesus eat the supper with? Twelve disciples. Do you think there was more believers than that at that time? You bet there were. You know, Acts records that there was 120 in the upper room at the day of Pentecost. And I bet there was even more than that. Yeah. So there's all these believers. You know, the church is large, but he's only sitting down with 12 people in a very intimate, personal setting in one room and eating that supper with them. Again, let's just do it by the examples that we're given. Because the only example you have of an old, a New Testament church doing it is in 1 Corinthians 11. There is no other one. And it's a bad example of them doing it wrong and messing it up. Okay, So it's the example of Acts chapter 2. What did we see there? They were, going, they were going house to house, breaking bread. Right? They were in one accord in the temple. Well, well they're all in one accord in the temple. Why didn't they just eat then? Right. They were all there. Right. No, they ate in the temple, or they, they, they were in one accord in the temple, but then they daily went house to house, didn't they? And break bread. House to house is how they did it. <coughs>
So we see again in 1 Corinthians, if you, I, you kept something there in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, the only example in the epistles is a bad example. It says, Now in this that I declare unto you, verse 17, I praise you not that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, now that's important, remember that, that how he's phrasing it, when you come together in the church, okay? I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. He goes on in verse 21. Uh, when you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Verse 20, now verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before his own supper, and one is hungry, and one is drunken. What have you not houses to eat and drink in, or despise you the church of God, and shame that have not? What, have I just, what, shall I say unto you, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So they're eating their own supper. Some are hungry. Some are drunken. There's heresies, there's divisions. This is not a model that we want to follow. He says there in, uh, look at verse 23, For I received of the Lord, which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord uh, Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, break it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This is the cup in the New Testament, uh, uh, New Testament in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, uh, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be uh, guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And basically, that's what was happening in the, in the Corinthian church. They were eating of that. They were partaking of it unworthily. Some were drunken. Some were hungry. There were divisions. There was heresies. They were not, they were not uh, worthily taking this, this Lord's Supper. So what does it mean to be unworthy? You know, to be unworthy of the Lord's Supper. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that just means that, you know, uh, you're not living right. You know, that you need to examine yourself in the fa and, and make sure that you're, you're living, living right for God. That if you've got unconfessed sin and you take the Lord's Supper, that you're going to fall over dead. Right? They, the Baptist churches teach this type of thing. And that's the real danger in having it in a large church, isn't it? Now the pastor has to go around and say, are you right with God before I give this to you unworthily and, and you eat and drink damnation to yourself? It's not talking about damnation in the sense that you lose your salvation, but that you bring on the judgment of God. Because you're not observing that supper as you should. You're not doing it in remembrance of Him. People just sit there and they just pop a little cracker and drink some juice and they think, well, I observed the Lord's Supper. They're just sitting back and just letting it take place. They're not, they're not, it's not bringing to remembrance the things which Christ has done. Now I'll say this, when, a perp when people observe this privately, you know, it's done on purpose. You have to decide to do this it causes you to start to rethink your spirituality. Right. It causes you to examine yourself in the faith. You know, when you're just showing up, oh, we're, it's Lord's Supper tonight, let's make sure we get there on time. And, no one, and everyone's eating it. There's people in there that are eating it unworthily. And they're receiving damnation. And not, again, not loss of salvation. They're receiving judgment from God. Because they're not doing it worthily. Worthily just means, you, you know, you have to be saved, you know. So you have unsaved people coming in. I mean, how do we know who's coming in here? Some stranger, some visitor comes in, oh, we're doing the Lord's Supper today, and we're going to give unsaved people the Lord's Supper, right? And again, this is another thing that I found is great about observing the Lord's Supper privately in a small group, you know, in people's homes and things like that. It gives you opportunity to discuss with them their salvation. Hey, tell me about the time you got saved. Amen. And then you, you find, because people come to church all the time, say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But when, you know, you never really have, when you really pin somebody down, you, sometimes you find out, well, this person isn't saved. Nine times out of ten, you find out, oh, this person's definitely saved. And then you can go ahead and, and drink that. Then you can observe it. Look there in verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not allowing it, that supper to do what it's supposed to do, to bring again remembrance of what Christ has done for us. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So that's what's going on there. There's people that are weak, and when it says sleep there, that they're dead. You know, talking about, that's what he refers to as Christians, they're sleeping. Right. And they, got to, they, they took a dirt nap. Right? That's what he's saying is going on, and that's why. You guys are observing this together, you're coming together, for the not for the better, but for the worse, right. and you guys are suffering for it. This is not a good example, friend. But when we are judged, we are chasing the Lord uh, that we should not be condemned the world. It says if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And that's really what we should be doing when we're observing the Lord's Supper as privately. When we set out and say, you know what, I'm going to do this. It's something I'm, I'm going to allow it to, to uh, work in my heart the way it should. I'm going to allow it to bring to remembrance the things that Christ do. And maybe it'll cause you to reflect and say, you know what, uh, 
man, I could do better in this area of my life. You know, there, there's something in my life that the Lord isn't pleased with. I'm going to get right. You know, it causes you to think that and to examine yourself, you know, and to, to see what your walk is really like. So Paul admonishes them to come together, right? He says to, for them to come together. Uh, <coughs> where is he? I'm trying to find that there. He says he, they should come together, but not to eat. Uh, but uh, they should come together to eat, but not all come together at once. Remember I mentioned that just a minute ago. He says when you come together in the church, you know, when you all come together in the church, he's saying, I, you know, I praise you not in this. Look at verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry for one another. He's saying, yeah, come together, but he didn't say you need to come together in the church. And he's saying to come together, but do it right. So this is, and that's consistent with the other examples. I mean, you know, you can disagree with them, and that's fine. I mean, you don't have to agree with this. This isn't a point of division. You know, there's, we have plenty of Baptist friends that don't believe like this. You know, I just had a, a I just this last week, I was talking to a Baptist preacher in another church, and he, he's like, well, you guys are wrong. I said, no, that's your opinion. You can, ha you can have your opinion. And here's the thing. As a small church, you could do this. You know, we're a small enough group, I feel like we could do it here. You know, we could talk amongst ourselves. You know, parents could make sure that they understand where the wh whether or not the kids should be observing it. We're a small enough group. We could do that if we wanted to. But, you know, and you don't have to agree with this. But here's the thing. Show me an example of a New Testament church doing it that's doing it right, that isn't suffering as a consequence. And then, and then show me, you know, then, then show me how, how we're wrong about interpreting the examples that are given in the Old Testament right. and how Jesus did it. Right. I mean, that's exactly how they did it. They did it in their homes, privately. They did it with a small group, just as 12 disciples, intimate gathering, and that's the examples that we, sh we see. Then, you know, we, we could get into, and for sake of time, we're gonna, we're gonna stop it here, it says, how often should it be done, right? If you're there, look at verse 25. How often should it be done? That's another thing that comes up. People will say, hey, you know, you should do it every week. You should do it once a month. You should do it once a year. But what does it say? <laughs> he said in verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So often you should do it, as often as you do it. There is no, see how this doctrine is not something that's just nailed down in scripture? This is exactly how you're supposed to do it, and this is when you're supposed to do it, and how many times. There's a lot of liberty given here. It's not something that's completely clear in Scripture. And that's why we shouldn't be so dogmatic about it. You know, and, and if other churches do it a different way, that's fine. You know, I, don't have any, I don't have a bone of contention with them. They can do whatever they want. But this is how you know, our pastor has ordained that we do it here. That's how we're going to do it. And I believe he's correct. So he says, as oft as you drink it. You know, and, and you could get into like, People want to do it on certain days. Like some people say, well, let's, let's do it on the Lord, you know, on the, on, the, on the Passover. If there was one day you should probably not do it on, it's probably that day. You don't want to start observing times and moons and seasons, right? He said avoid that kind of thing. And in fact, if you recall in Acts, that's exactly what we see. They, they came, the disciples came to the break bread after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? So you could do it that day, but that would probably be the one day you don't want to do it. Because <laughs> then you start having to, you know, get on the Jewish calendar and all these things and it gets weird. I think you should just do it as you're moved. Right. You know, it's something that you should just do. Now, to understand exactly how to do it, I, I, you know, for sake of time, I would just encourage you to go to the website, the church website, and just go on the preaching page. There's a search bar, and just type in how to observe Lord's Supper, or just type in Lord's Supper or Supper. You know, these things will come up, and watch that sermon, how to observe the Lord's Supper that was just preached recently. And if there's anyone here that has any questions about how to observe the Lord's Supper, you can come talk to me. And we can even have somebody come and observe it with you just to show you how it's done to be. It's not that complicated. Most people pick it up pretty quick. But if you want to know more about how to actually do it, you know, what things we should keep in mind when we do it, watch that sermon or come talk to me. But other than that, that's going to be the sermon this morning. Again, so why do we, you know, uh, we're going through this series and it can, it can seem like a dry subject at, on the surface, doesn't it? We're going to talk about the two ordinances. I mean, uh, why, aren't we, why aren't you debunking flat earth? You know, why aren't you, why aren't you debunking Nephilim? Why aren't you, why aren't you talking about the, the raging sodomites again? Why aren't, why aren't you preaching some, you know, just off major, you know, uh, provocative sermon? But these are the things that matter. Right. These are the nuts and bolts of the Christian life. Yeah. These are the things that are make, up, make us who we are, you know. And this is, and every time we get into it, I get into it and study it out, I'm amazed at these doctrines. You know, the one of the, the priests and believers, amazing doctrine. This is no different. You know, it should move us. You know, we have, 
uh, a great privilege that we can take the time to stop in our busy lives and observe what Christ has done for us through the ordinances of baptism and through the ordinance of observing the Lord's Supper. Let's go ahead and pray.